Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Let's do a quick technical check, just go through a few of the logistics. So audience video and audio, and audio have been automatically muted and turned off. We'll have some time at the end for question answers. So if you have a question, please send them to me, Mary Bodine Watts in the chat function, and I'll put together a list of the questions and we'll get through as many of them as we can at the end. We should have about 10, 15 minutes, we hope. And the presentation does have closed captioning on, so you can take advantage of that. You can move around the box if it's in your way or you want it somewhere else. I believe you can also turn it off individually on your own screens if you wish. And finally, this session is being recorded, so act uh, accordingly. And that shouldn't be an issue since folks will mostly be muted and, and their video off. So I guess I'll act accordingly. <laughs> Okay, with that, are we still good on on audio, everybody? Yeah, okay. Just want to make sure before we dive in. So I'd like to start off by thanking the Lewis and Clark Gender Studies Symposium and Kim and the student uh, co-host for putting together this presentation and inviting us to speak on this important topic. We are here today to share about missing and murdered Indigenous women. And I'm going to share our slide deck that we have. Let me see, get to the right one. And... Even though we go through this a million times, here we go. Share screen. Okay. So got our slide deck and now I'm fully ready to go. So my name is Mary Bodine Watts. I'm a citizen from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Indian Reservation of Oregon that's here uh, just about two hours over Mount Hood on the other side, a bit to the east. I graduated from Lewis and Clark College in 2009 with a degree in environmental studies. And then I went on to Lewis and Clark Law School where I studied federal Indian law and environmental law. I currently work at Bonneville Power Administration as an attorney in our power section and in my free time I currently teach federal Indian law at the law school. In 2018 the American Indian Alaska Native Council at Bonneville Power Administration put together a presentation on missing and murdered women to share really with all of our colleagues. We had a great opportunity to to share this information and really just put on a training for our, our friends and colleagues at the, the agency. And so we, we took the opportunity and this presentation is kind of what came out of that. And now we have that, that opportunity to share the same presentation here. And it's largely all of the same information that we shared from two years ago, but we have taken the time to, to update it with some of the most relevant information that's happened in the last two years. I will note that the information that we're sharing today, um, our presentation, our comments, the, the PowerPoint, all of it is just our own individual perspectives and information that we've found and developed on our own time. So it's not the, the views or the expressions of Bonneville Power Administration or any of our respective employers. Some of us have moved on to different um, opportunities. So we're a bit scattered all over the Portland metro area now, but just, Again, none of it is reflective of our, our employers' views or perspectives. Um, so our presentation today is going to start with Katie McDonald giving an overview of what murdered and missing Indigenous women is, and we'll also refer to it as MMIW for short. I will provide a legal background, and that kind of gets into what has pro proliferated this issue. Karina Ekakola will then cover statistics and data around MMIW, and Caroline Ruach will address other causes that are contribu contributing to the high numbers of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Katie will then conclude our presentation with what is happening to combat MMIW and how to get involved. And again, we will have uh, about 10 minutes, we hope, at the end for questions. And each of our presenters will share a little bit, um, will introduce themselves ahead of their, their um, individual sections. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Katie to kick us off. Thanks, Mary. Good afternoon, everybody. Kwechus chant, Kathleen Mali, Louise Quex, Janessa Kai, Kinsale, Skelehu. 
Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katie McDonald. Um, I let you know that I am a Bitterroot Salish Indian. I am currently uh, working at Metro as their tribal policy advisor and was a previous employee at Bonneville Power, where I had the opportunity to work with Mary, Caroline, and Karina to develop these materials. And it's so great to be here. Um, I had a few additional kind of housekeeping things that I wanted to mention on the front end of our presentation, just including that. Um, you know, providing an opportunity for everybody who's in the conversation today to take some time to check in with yourself because we want to have this be a trauma informed conversation. We wanted to let you know that we'll be discussing difficult topics and difficult matters today that might be triggering for folks in the audience if you have any previous experiences with your family or within your community. Um, so please take all the time you need and, and use whatever approach feels best to engage with us in this presentation and conversation. We also want to acknowledge that all communities and all people regrettably and very unfortunately experience violence and our presentation today is focusing on highlighting and discussing the impacts of violence in tribal communities and how the unique political status of tribal governments and their citizens as sovereign nations creates challenges in responding to these matters. Please note that as we move through the materials today, each of our speakers is going to be taking a few minutes to remember and honor um, personal connections that they have to Indigenous women that might be in their family, a friend or in their community who are currently missing or who have been lost and crossed over to the spirit world. These are emotional stories um, for us to share and we really appreciate everybody's understanding as we walk through these challenging materials today. And I guess just one other thing to throw out there is a constant reminder to folks, Indigenous people, federally recognized tribes and tribal communities are all unique with their own experiences, views and positions. and you know, indigenous folks are not a monolith. So just taking into consideration that again, these are our, our, our own interpretation and review of information that we feel like is helpful to make progress on this particular issue. Um, so this is my remembering. Um, Misty Hirsch was 38 and a mother of two when she was shot in the head in a drive-by shooting in Spokane, Washington after pulling over to wave by a vehicle that was trailing her car. Uh, Misty and I went to school together at Salish Kootenai College, a tribal college in Northwest Montana. We were classmates and colleagues um, and friends, and it was uh, very hard for our community to lose her. The other person featured on this slide is a woman named Jessie, who was 36 and a mother of four when she was beaten and pushed out of a vehicle that was driving recklessly at times over 100 miles per hour. Jessie, in her experience, the day that she passed on, sent a text message to a friend asking them to call the cops. So she knew the driver of the car that she was in was trying to kill her. Um, both of these women were really important in, in my community and their loss is still felt today and their losses have not been resolved. Um, and just in checking on Facebook today before coming to this presentation, it was really disheartening to see that there are actually two more women from my community who are missing since the last time I checked, including a woman named Cheyenne Quickwasu and another woman named Miranda Rose Penmel. Can we go to the next slide, Mary? Um, so what is MMIW? Mary started to talk about this. It's an umbrella term covering missing and murdered indigenous women and the domestic sexual and significant violence and crimes that those women experience. Well, I wanna acknowledge that um, MMIW is a subset of uh, an, another endemic problem that has to do with missing and murdered Indigenous people is we've mentioned a couple of times we're focusing on missing and murdered Indigenous women today. Uh, within tribal communities across the country, there's significant loss and systemic violence against our life givers, daughters, mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmas, and friends at endemic level. Uh, domestic and sexual violence is an issue that all people in all communities in the United States Face, but for American Indian and Alaska Native women, this issue is especially pronounced and difficult to tackle. The issue has been recognized by the United Nations in 2019 as a significant issue that Indigenous women in US Canada are facing at rates that require expedited action. I think we all believe that justice should have no jurisdictional gaps, but in Indian country and for Indigenous women, it has many. Today, we'll be breaking down and discussing elements of why these gaps exist, what contributes to this endemic and what communities are doing to tackle the issue. Next slide, please. These are some high level facts and numbers that I'll let folks kind of try to read the slide. While you're reading that, I'll also provide some summary statistics. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 
Homicide is the third leading cause of death among American Indian and Alaska Native women between 10 and 24 years of age. Homicide is the fifth leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Native women between 25 and 34 years of age. The Department of Justice has reported that American Indian and Alaska Native women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. With the levels of domestic and sexual violence against Native women um, at such high levels, I think that our group definitely felt like there's an opportunity at Bonneville in our previous roles to make sure that as um, individuals, as community members, as neighbors, we had a responsibility and opportunity to make all people aware of this. Um, nationwide, the voices of indigenous people have united to raise awareness about this issue. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Portland, it's something that we should all be acutely aware of. In Portland alone, the American Indian Alaska Native population is over 50,000 people descended from more than 380 tribes or bands from across the United States. For many years, Portland has been one of the largest urban Indian centers in the United States. Uh, further in the state of Oregon, we have nine federally recognized tribal nations and many neighboring tribal nations close by in Washington, California, and Idaho who all experience this issue. By taking time to learn about this issue, we each equip ourselves with information to be allies, supporters, and doers to try to help combat what's happening. And I'll stop there, Mary, if you wanna go ahead and jump into some of the legal framework, thanks. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. So as Katie stated, we're each gonna present kind of a remembering at the beginning. And so we, we all have personal stories of individual women who have been murdered or are missing. And from what, one of my remembering, I'm actually gonna to do too. I wanted to share Selena Not Afraid story because it's so relevant. This was from December, 2019, February-ish timeframe. And for all of us, we have a lot of native connections on social media and, um, when individuals are reported missing, the mobilization is usually first seen through social media. And so I remember when the Facebook feeds and Instagram posts started showing Selena missing, and there was eventually a New York Times article and FBI posts and Dateline flyer. So this actual case gained a lot of momentum, but then everything just went quiet. And it was only on social media where you started to see all the condolences going to Selena's family. So Selena was found dead in a field with insufficient clothing for the weather. It was winter in Montana. So you should be fully clothed with, a, you know, heavy coats and, and boots and all of that. And it was determined that there was no foul play and that she just died from exposure. At a, and that she was found back, you know, about a mile behind a, a rest stop. So it really doesn't make sense why you would go wandering away from a rest stop with, um, no clothing or insufficient clothing. And you know, as a very similar story happened with my friend's mother was found dead in the Columbia River on Thanksgiving day. And again, very unusual circumstances. The family had no reason to, to suspect that she would be out at the river on that day or the night before, and they had been expecting her home. And of course, unusual circumstances, but the, the death was again ruled accidental drowning. So in both cases, the families believed that there was more to the story, but further investigation was never made. And we see this pattern over and over with Indigenous women going missing and then being found dead or um, never found at all. And so just in the last, <clears throat> in the last week, I've pulled, I've just been taking screenshots on the, my Facebook account as all of these posts come through my feed. So I just kind of wanted to highlight how we're seeing this event unfold in front of our own eyes on a daily basis. So getting back to, I wanted to jump into the, the legal perspective. So why is this happening? I'm gonna start with a case study which is perfect for a symposium type event. So let's start by considering an example. We're gonna imagine we're on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. It's in Eastern Oregon, like I said, and maybe you're on your way to Bend for the weekend and you're heading east on Highway 26 and you pull over in the Tribal Community Center parking lot just to stretch your legs. You're minding your own business when you see two people fighting. There's a non-Indian spouse of a Warm Springs tribal member and uh, they're being assaulted by their partner. So you call the police, do the right thing, and tribal police show up. There also, let's just hypothetically say, a state trooper happens to be traveling through the reservation 
uh, also on Highway 26, and they see all the commotion, so they also stop, wondering if they can be helpful. The attack stops, and the non-Indian perpetrator walks away. The tribal police and the state trooper both kind of look at each other, and they don't do anything about it. And I'm going to explain how we reach such an absurd result. And this is kind of all through criminal jurisdiction, why tribes have criminal jurisdiction over Indian country, and how that has been limited by Congress in a way that actually has some of these unintended consequences. But this context will help show why neither police could arrest the perpetrator in this example. So starting with criminal jurisdiction. So criminal jurisdiction, what is it? It's the power of a sovereign or a government to create criminal laws and punish those who violate such laws. Typically a government has full criminal jurisdiction everywhere within its territorial boundaries. So for example, you live in Oregon, when you commit a crime in Oregon, you fully expect that the state of Oregon can prosecute you for that crime. Likewise, if you travel and go into Washington, you kind of expect that you are submitting to the sovereignty of Washington and that if you commit a crime in Washington that the state of Washington can then uh, prosecute you for such crime. For tribes, tribes have criminal jurisdiction over Indian country and Indian country is defined by statute to include all lands within any Indian reservation. So let's talk now about tribal sovereignty, what that means. Oops, there we go. Got the right slide. So why do tribes have criminal jurisdiction over their own territory? This all stems from tribes' inherent jurisdiction, their inherent sovereignty. Tribes retain inherent sovereignty unless it has been divested by consent or through an act of Congress. It's a common misconception that tribes were given sovereignty, but in fact that they've always retained their own sovereignty. It's not something that was given by the United States or given by treaty or given by statute. Instead, it just flows uh, from the status of, of Indian tribes as sovereigns that pre-existed the United States and the Constitution. In Ex Parte Crow Dog, a Supreme Court case, the court considered whether the federal government could prosecute the murder of one Indian by another Indian that was committed in Indian country. And the Supreme Court in this early case found that because tribes have retained tribal sovereignty, the federal government does not have prosecutorial authority in Indian country, meaning the federal government could not therefore prosecute that crime. So this case was a big win in Indian country, but it didn't last that way for a long time. So let's talk about the Major Crimes Act. Coming out of that ex parte Crow Dog case, the general population was outraged really by the Supreme Court's ruling that the federal government could not prosecute a murder and that the media um, really grabbed onto that case and kind of chalked it up as a bunch of lawless Indians on the reservation who were murdering their own people and not gonna do anything about it. So in response, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act. So this specific piece of legislation extends federal jurisdiction to Indian country over 13 major criminal offenses. So this means that the federal government now took that um, jurisdiction and they can go in and prosecute for these type of crimes. Notably, the list of crimes includes many of those which we see committed against women, such as murder, rape, and aggravated assault. So now the federal government has the responsibility to investigate and prosecute these type of crimes. However, a 2017 study shows that the United States Attorney's Office declined to prosecute in nearly 40% of cases, a majority of which were sexual assault and sexual exploitation. So even though the FBI is supposed to go in and, and investigate and prosecute these cases, they're not um, doing so. Another Supreme Court case that affects this issue. It's important to note that tribes can still prosecute the, for those major crimes in tribal court through concurrent jurisdiction. However, there's another of limiting factors that make that um, that really just restrict the power of tribal courts in matters involving serious crimes. So most notably is this Supreme Court case called Oliphant versus Suquamish. 
And in this case, the Supreme Court had to decide whether Indian tribal courts have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. In this case, a non-Indian was arrested and charged by tribal police for assaulting a tribal officer and resisting arrest during the Suquamish tribe's chief Seattle days, a large festival with lots of non-Indians invited into the tribal community. The Supreme Court held that Indian tribal courts do not have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians for conduct occurring on Indian land. Simply put, tribes cannot prosecute the criminal conduct of non-Indians. So this is probably one of the, the most, um, one of the factors that, underlying factors that most hinders um, tribal, tribal courts. So complicating, questions. So we've got to put it all together. A lot of stuff going on that I've kind of thrown out you. In any criminal issues, you need to go through a comprehensive analysis to determine who has just jurisdiction over the crime. So this is for federal Indian law. So the first step is looking at, are we in Indian country? Remember that, that definition I gave earlier. Most of the time, if you're within a reservation, you're going to be in Indian country. Step two, who is the, the offender? Because based on our, our Supreme Court cases, now it matters whether or not you're an Indian or a non-Indian, and it matters if you were killed by an Indian or a non-Indian. And this inquiry has multiple layers because there's also a lot of different cases on what does it mean to be an Indian? Do you have to be half Indian blood? Does, it, does Indian blood matter at all? Does, do you just need to be enrolled by a tribe? Lots of different aspects on that piece of the, the step. And for criminal jurisdiction, um, Indian is defined as enrolled member of tribe or recognized as Indian by a governmental entity and possessing some degree of Indian blood. So complicated inquiry, Justin, who is going to be subject to jurisdiction? Step three, what law and jurisdiction apply? So after deciphering through the facts necessary to answer the first two questions, you can then determine what laws and jurisdiction are going to apply. So we have a couple rubrics that just kind of show the complex uh, nature of this inquiry. So if the victim is Indian, non-Indian, the jurisdiction of Indian for major crimes, and the tribe would have jurisdiction over an Indian for both the major crimes and other crimes under the tribal code. But if you're a um, non-Indian offender, you'll see that the jurisdiction is going to become limited to the federal government or the state with either, um, depending on who the victim is. But so if it wasn't complicated enough, there's still another layer to this, uh, this puzzle, really. And that's something called public law 280. So by statute, Congress has transferred it's federal criminal jurisdiction to a number of mandatory or optional states. And in a public law 280 state, when an Indian commits a crime against another Indian, it falls under the Major Crimes Act and the state has jurisdiction. All their crimes are gonna be subject to tribal jurisdiction. And so you can see um, the federal government gets replaced by state jurisdiction. So if a non-Indian offender in a public law 280 states commits a crime against an Indian, jurisdiction will be exclusively under the state. But with public law 280, when Congress passed this act, they didn't actually extend any additional funding or support to the states. So um, organs of public law 280, think one of the reservations, Pendleton, it's way out in rural um, Eastern Oregon. So there's going to need to be, uh, it's going to be an extra expense and cost to get the state police to go all the way out to Pendleton to in investigate crimes and issues. Another issue is with tribal court sentencing. Tribes are limited in their ability to sentence. So even if jurisdiction falls under the tribe's authority, so crimes that are not a major crime, Indians, Indian tribes can prosecute, but they're limited to six months of jail time and up to $500 fines. So it's, it's really a disincentive for a, for a tribe to take on that prosecutorial authority if, you know, somebody commits 
murder on the reservation, the FBI is not looking into it, or if it's a public law 280 and the state isn't investigating, if the tribe exercises its concurrent jurisdiction and they want to prosecute, they're only going to be able to put somebody in jail for six months or a $500 fine. And that, that's since been increased under the Indian Civil Rights Act to one year in jail and a $5,000 fine. And you can get potentially up to three years for repeat offenders. So it's still, the, the punishment really doesn't fit the crime. So it's not, um, it's just a, another way that tribes are limited in being able to address this problem. Okay, so one other aspect is the Violence Against Women Act. So an attempt by Congress to, to pass some of these issues is the Violence Against Women's Act, and it ex extends special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction to tribes. So this actually means gives some tribes the authority to prosecute um, non-Indians that commit crimes on the reservation. Unfortunately, there's only a handful of tribes that have taken on the special domestic violence jurisdiction. There's only 18 of them. And even when they do exercise the special jurisdiction, the authority is still limited to prosecuting cases of domestic violence where the offender has an existing relationship to the, the victim. And unfortunately, there's an incredibly large number of assaults against Native women that are done by non-Indian strangers. So this jurisdictional fix still would fail to address that problem. And there's also uh, another federal response happening at the congressional level is Savannah's Act. So this was presented in Congress, I think two years ago, it was recently signed, I believe in October by President Trump. So this is now a law. And what it does is directs the Department of Justice to develop law enforcement and justice protocols to address missing and murdered Indians. So while it's a really significant and good step in the right direction, it mostly provides for tracking and um, funding to help local agencies um, do more tracking of these type, type of cases. So it's not a as strong of a fix it, that is needed legally to address the problem. And the same is true with state and tribal activism. There's a lot of good things going on, but again, it's just not, um, it's not quite enough to, to fill the, the gaps. So let's revisit our case study. So again, we're on the reservation and you see the two people fighting. Non-Indian is assaulting a tribal member and the tribal police show up and a state trooper shows up. So consistent with that Oliphant Supreme Court decision, the tribal police have no jurisdiction over the non-Indian criminal conduct. And under Public Law 280, Warm Springs is actually exempt. So the state trooper has no jurisdiction to arrest the non-Indian for the criminal conduct. So this leaves the feds, the federal government with the exclusive prosecutorial authority to address this issue, but that will take time for the FBI to actually want to come and prosecute that case. So this is a jurisdictional maze that leaves cases unprosecuted. It leaves criminals at large and it sends the message that Indians are an easy target. And the jurisdictional nightmare has provided the foundation for missing and murdered indigenous women to become an epidemic. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Karina. Hi, Yad Esh, a Karina Ikakola, and she has said this gives me Nishlan, the Lagana Bashish Chink, the Lana Dasha Che. My name is Karina Ikakola. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I am from the Rock Gap clan with my maternal grandfather from the Many Goats clan. And I am from the small rural reservation community of Cameron. Arizona, and um, but I did grow up in other various places as well. Um, if you've ever been to the south rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, there's a good chance you actually drove right through Cameron. We are literally at the gateway to the Grand Canyon. I've been working at BPA in the Tribal Affairs Office as a tribal liaison for nearly 19 years, and um, I've been in the Pacific Northwest now longer than just about anywhere, so I consider this place home now. Um, so today my remembering is Amanda Webster. Amanda was murdered in December 2018. She is from my community in Cameron. Uh, I knew Amanda because she dated my cousin for a while and they lived just a couple doors down from my grandma. And we were Facebook friends. So 
even after she had moved on from her relationship with my cousin, I still kind of followed her online and kept up with what she was up to. Uh, for a long time, Navajo men have worked as iron workers and pipe fitters and other various um, and other various trades. And it's very common for Navajo men to travel all throughout the United States working on various projects. And now it's actually becoming more common for Navajo women to do the same. Uh, women are getting into welding and other various trades as well. And uh, sometimes the Navajo women travel in female crews and work to provide for their families. And as you know, the trades uh, tend to pay pretty well. So Amanda had just had a baby a few months before and then decided that it was time that she would get back to work. And so she was actually working out in Kentucky with another female friend and uh, she was murdered by someone who was staying in her hotel and she left behind uh, three children and her fiance. Um, go ahead, next slide, Mary. So I'm gonna go over uh, the numbers and statistics and go over some of the police enforcement issues really quickly. Go ahead, next slide. The MMIW movement started actually in Canada by the First Nations people. And it's a well-known fact within Indian country, we have high rates of missing and murdered people, both male and female. The First Nations people at a grassroots level came together and forced this issue to gain national attention through their demonstration. The Canadian government heard them and conducted a national inquiry to look into, MM, into the MMIW issue. Next slide. And Canada's national inquiry um, presented a report in September 2nd, uh, 2019. And the report finds that violence towards missing, murdered and indigenous women and girls amounts to genocide. Uh, the prime minister, Justin Trudeau made a formal statement, which you can listen to online, that he accepted accepts the inquiry's finding. And as you can see here from the graphic, indigenous women are only 4% of the Canadian female population, but they're actually 16% of the murdered women between 1980 and 2012. The number of 582 women uh, since 2010 um, are documented as missing and murdered, and experts actually believe that the MMIW number in Canada um, from the 1970s is actually more accurately around 4,000. Next slide. So soon after the Canadians uh, First Nations demonstrations, tribes in the United States also worked to bring national attention to this issue here in the United States. So grassroots demonstrations soon followed and have continued to take place around the United States. Um, this demonstration pictured here, it was held in Forks, Washington, near the Quileute Indian Reservation on the Washington coast. Next slide. So one of the major issues is that data is very limited. Most MMIW reports reference a Department of Justice Commission report that was completed back in 2008. However, the report is um, limited and acknowledges its main, many data weaknesses. A few years ago, Anita Lucchese, a doctoral student at the time, worked to make sense of the existing data and also helped to work to identify data gaps. And through her research, Anita gained the attention of the Seattle Urban Indian Health Institute. And they reached out to Anita and they partnered with her to produce a new report that was uh, released at the end of 2018. Next slide. So usually when, uh, doing this presentation, I show a video clip here, but I recommend watching um, a program called Fault Lines. You can watch it free on YouTube and it's 26 minutes long and it highlights three families cases and provides a broad look at the issues surrounding MMIW. And um, in this program, Anita talks about issues surrounding data collection. And she points out, we can't solve problems we don't track and that the data that is available does not provide any context to the numbers. She also explains that historically tribes have not been included in the data gathering process and also that tribes have not been in included in the data analysis process. She also explains that there's a great need to collect as much data as possible so we can get an accurate picture of the issue. And finally, with accurate data, tribes can then make data-driven decisions to protect Native American women and girls. Next slide. 
So the National Crime Information Center. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, reported that cumulatively up to 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls. However, through the Department of Justice's Federal Missing Persons Database, also called NamUs, um, only 16, 116 of those cases were logged. Um, the 5,712 MMIW number is widely acknowledged to be majorly underreported. So um, I'll go into you know, reporting issues here just in a minute. And um, however, until recently, no research has been done um, about the rates of violence of American Indian Alaska Native women living in urban areas. So mostly it was just on reservations. So living in urban areas. Next slide. And this is important because approximately 71% of American Indian and Alaska Native people live in urban areas today. So as I mentioned before, Anita Lucchese partnered with the Seattle Urban Indian Institute, Health Institute to conduct a study about MMIW cases in urban areas. Um, Native people live in urban areas for many reasons. Um, one reason is because of the federal policy and program of relocation, which was an effort by the federal government to move Native people off tribal lands into urban areas in the 1950s. Another reason is because of the federal termination policies of the 1950s, which Western Oregon was actually ground zero for this policy. Tribal lands were actually surplused by the federal government requiring, requiring tribal people to move, which many um, of those folks moved to urban areas. Um, also, many people left because of education and employment opportunities and also the lack of housing on reservations. And additionally, when some tribes were um, federally recognized, lands were never reserved um, in the form of a reservation, so making them actually landless tribes. Next slide. So in the study, um, the study attempted to collect data from 71 cities in 29 states. Uh, these cities were selected because they had an urban uh, health center affiliated with the Seattle Indian Urban Health Institute or had a significant native population or were found to have large numbers of MMIW cases identified by local community leaders. Um, it is really important to note that two thirds of the cities that they had, the study group had reached out to um, did not provide data or just very limited data. Police departments that did not provide data in this report actually included Portland, Oregon and Albuquerque among other major cities with high native populations. Um, the report also provides significant detail about data collection in, uh, issues and highlights problems such as issues with um, some de police department's FOIA request processes. Um, so for example, some departments actually charge fees associated with data requests. And in some cases, um, the study group actually did not have money to pay for those fees to access that information. Additionally, um, the report highlighted the, um, that, that there's limited capacity for police departments to search their databases for existing data. So they just literally didn't have the personnel to even start to look. There was also issues with poor record keeping protocols and inconsistency of data collection methods um, and including methods of identifying race over time resulting in racial misclassifications. And this problem is actually pretty significant. So for example, um, in the Southwest and in, like, in California, there are many tribal people with names that are, are usually associated with like a Latinx heritage, um, like Morales and um, Lucero, among other names. And we have coworkers in our group at BP that also have last name Lopez, for example. So oftentimes these names are not associated with Native American affiliation. And so um, they're not categorized as an MMIW person. And even if the person is um, classified as Native American, most often their tribal affiliation is not identified. And um, there are also many departments that do not track race. And there are also instances, instances of Native people being classified as white. Um, 
Also historically, the letter N has been used to identify both Native Americans and also members of the Black community. And again, uh, this is not consistent across the nation, across all police departments. Um, and again, many tribal people's deaths are awful, also being misclassified as suicides, um, death by exposure or accidents when um, families have evidence to believe otherwise. So next slide. So the results, so the Seattle Urban Institute study with next to no budget to pay for information requests and with unfortunately um, most cities not responding to information requests identified 506 cases. And uh, because of data issues again, 80% of these cases uh, occurred since uh, 2010. Um, accessing historical information was extremely difficult and the study group just simply wasn't able to get that data. Um, but as experts estimate, given all the data sources and acknowledging the limitations, they actually estimate that the cumulative MMIW cases are actually closer um, overall to 20,000. So the key takeaway here is that there's a ton of work to be done in the data collection um, arena. Um, also, with this report and, and since this graphic came out, the missing um, indigenous women cases at the time were 128. I just checked the NamUs website on Monday, and that stands for, again, National Missing and, um, and an Unidentified Person System, and the missing number now is 215, so that number has doubled since we have given this presentation just a little over a year ago. I also want to note that there are also 492 males, Native American males, also listed as missing, um, so again, like Katie mentioned um, many states are now uh, directing their efforts to be more inclusive and calling uh, looking out for MMIP data. And also just a reminder, this is the number of people missing, not murdered. Um, those are not included in those, in those numbers. When the report was released, it identified that out of all the cities that responded, Seattle actually had the most cases of MMIW in the nation, and New Mexico was the highest state of MMIW, and that actually excluded the Albuquerque Police Department's data. So that was even counted, and they were the highest state. And half of all the murders were committed by non-Native perpetrators. Um, next slide. So just last month, February 2021, the District of Oregon U.S. Attorney's Office released a missing and murdered Indigenous persons report. And basically, the report starts out, again, by acknowledging the data issues. The report utilizes data from um, the U.S. Uh, District of Oregon U.S. Attorney's Office, the National Crime Information Center database, Oregon State Police Records, and again, the, the uh, National Missing and Unidentified Person Systems Database. The report acknowledges the lack of consistent and current data. The data is problematic because each data source has its own parameters and definitions of what they would qualify as MMIP data. So um, consequently, consequently, the data sources have various numbers across Oregon. And the U.S. Attorney's Office is now in the process of examining all the MMIP data and identifying barriers, protocol gaps in collecting accurate data. Next slide. So this initial report finds out that Oregon has 11 missing Indigenous persons and eight murdered Indigenous persons connected to Oregon. And as you can see, again, the numbers are not across um, excuse me, the same across the various data sets. And uh, most of these numbers are fairly recent. Next slide. So now that the report has been released, they are implementing an action plan. And as you can see here, they are starting tribal consultations. They're working to gather more data, develop community response plans. They're creating a state work group. They're increasing collaboration and communications. And they are um, uh, addressing issues with the Oregon State Police report. They also did their own report. Which, what is also exciting is they hired, a, I hope I say her name right, um, Cedar Wilkie Gillette this last year, and she's an enrolled member of the Mandan Hidatsa Arikara Nation and is a direct descendant of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. And she has her Juris Doctorate from the Vermont Law School and a bachelor's degree in applied social justice and human rights activism from uh, University of Minnesota. And so prior to coming to this position, she had conducted extensive research on um, indigenous human rights and environmental justice issues. So I have not met her personally, but it sounds like they got the right person for the job. And we're really glad to see that now there are resources funding this position so she can continue um, 
the work of data collection. So the report starts that as of February last month, she's working to gather data from all law enforcement offices that respond to Oregon tribes or relevant tribal offices that would also have MMIP data. Um, data would include name, gender, tribal affiliation, missing and murdered circumstances, and the case status of all cases of missing and murdered indigenous people. Additionally, she's gonna work to help tackle the racial misclassification issue and um, other factors related to underreporting. And she's actually gonna be working with tribes to collect their data. And, and to our knowledge, I don't think that's been, like tribes have not been included in that process to date. So this is gonna be really great that she's, be able to be, she's actually gonna be working directly with the tribes. Um, next slide. So um, if you have time, I recommend reading the report. At the end of the report, it's um, they have pictures of the missing people that they currently have identified. Um, this is just the beginning of the data collection efforts. There's a lot of work to do. Um, and I also recommend Googling a Cedar Wilkie Gillette um, because of the reports recent release. Um, she's actually been on a couple of radio stations just in like the last week, um, like OPB. And um, you can listen to more about her efforts and her offers, her office's efforts. Next slide. So as Mary said, um, depending on the crime, who the victim is and who the perp is, an array of law enforcement may respond to the call. Sometimes even the county will respond, which may or may not be acceptable to the tribe. Complicated jurisdictional issues still produce um, unique barriers to American Indian Alaska Native women seeking help from the criminal justice authorities on tribal lands. Um, ju the jurisdictional confusion sometimes results in inadequate or delayed response times to crimes. Um, studies have found that officers may hesitate um, to respond to a call because they believe the crime should be addressed by a different agency. So sometimes there are cases that just fall through the cracks. Next slide. And another issue with law enforcement, um, fundamentally, tribal law enforcement and also um, non-tribal rural smaller law enforcement agencies do not have the resources they need. And so um, insufficient funding, oftentimes there's not enough officers to patrol and investigate crimes. And in the past when we presented this, um, I would show a clip of a Navajo Nation police officer um, who spoke about the challenges and he describes that they only oftentimes have one officer cover covering vast large areas of land. Response times depending on the location can be a couple hours. Additionally, he explains that they are so responsible busy responding to calls, they don't actually have the investigative staffing and resources that they need to actually to look in um, into crimes. Often um, smaller and tribal police departments um, have inadequate training, um, inadequate data tracking processes, limited specialized officers for particular types of victimization. So this includes rape and intimate partner violence. Um, oftentimes departments have high turnover and low morale among police officers, which can lead to poor job performance. Additionally, there's like geographic and national, or sorry, natural barriers on some reservations. So it can be challenging just to patrol and respond to calls. Um, and again, um, victims' perceptions of law enforcement, oftentimes there's just an, a, a lack of trust. And so that leads to underreporting. And then for major crimes, uh, federal law enforcement officers, so like the FBI, are rarely the first person to um, res respond to violent crime in Indian country. Next slide. So real quickly, um, some of you may have seen the um, movie Wind River that was released a couple years ago. For those of you who haven't, Wind River is a chilling thriller that follows rookie FBI agent Elizabeth Olsen, who teams up with a local game tracker with deep community ties. So that's, he's played by Jeremy Renner to investigate the murder of a local girl on a remote Native American reservation. The movie is beautifully shot, beautiful cinematography. The movie highlights many of the issues we've already discussed surrounding the MMIW issue, including the lack of resources at both the tribe and the FBI, complicated jurisdictional issues, violence, and poverty, to name a few. Um, after watching the movie, um, of course, uh, you, you feel troubled given the content and the reality of the situation. But um, after I was watching, I was a little concerned because um, I felt like the movie only highlighted problems and issues around, uh, uh, of reservation life. And of course, I know that during the short time they have to show a movie or an issue, they're not able to cover um, 
some of the good things about living in a tribal community. So I want to say like after watching the movie, there's probably many people who would think like, why do people even live there? Or why would I ever even want to visit a tribal community? And the movie really didn't have the opportunity to uh, show the beautiful and amazing things about living in a tribal community. Uh, my personal experience is that there's many things that I loved living in, on the reservation. There's a sense of community and um, each reservation and community is different and everyone's experience in living in a tribal community is different. And so I don't wanna make light or, of the issue or minimize it, but I wanna also say there are positive things happening on um, our tribal lands as well. There's also another movie coming out um, based on the book, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. And I've seen posts, I think, let me say his name right, is it Martin Scorsese? <laughs> and Leonardo DiCaprio recently meeting with tribal leaders. And I've seen that they've cast um, some Native American, um, Native women recently. So Indian country is really excited about that. And I'm sure given the content of the book, there's gonna be an element of MMIW covered in that movie as well, given the topic. So um, keep a lookout for that. And with that, I'll turn the time over to the next presenter. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Yate Shike Shike Do Shidene Shie Caroline Ruwak Yanishe Kia Ani Nishle Skidi Pani Bashishin uh Torichini Dashishe Skidi Pani Dashishnali Akot Ego Dine Atsan Nishle. Basically, I just introduced myself in my uh, Navajo language, and um, I'm sure there might be some uh, Navajo uh, speakers out there that uh, will know that I'm not, uh, I wasn't originally a Navajo speaker, so forgive my poor pronunciations. But um, uh, anyway, uh, we have been uh, listening to speakers, and we've, we've presented a lot of facts and figures, and um, <clears throat> so I, I just want everybody to kind of take a, a deep breath at this point and just kind of, you know, focus on what we're saying. And I know that this uh, environment right now is kind of trying already and we're, we're giving you some heavy stuff. So um, we honor that. Um, and with that said, I'm about to delve into some, some heavy things. Um, and I'm going to relate to you two of my experiences and two of the losses in my life that affected me personally growing up. Um, so <clears throat> this first slide uh, is Priscilla Lee Yaza. Um, and she was the older sister of one of my best friends. And she was only about two years older than me. And, and she was a good friend of my older sister. Um, in 1984, um, in Fort Defiance, Arizona, on the Navajo Nation, uh, Priscilla was kidnapped, raped, and murdered. She was at home with her mother and infant daughter when a man yielding a gun broke into their home. <clears throat> and he shot Priscilla's mother in the head and left the baby unharmed. And he took Priscilla. Um, the next day, she was found in a nearby gully, dead, naked and sexually violated and shot in the back of the head. Priscilla's mother, uh, Priscilla's murder was never solved. And her mother who mirac miraculously survived the attack said that the man who murdered Priscilla was Caucasian and that, um, that the family didn't know him. Uh, family members have asserted that crucial evidence was destroyed by incompetent tribal police who arrived at the scene um, and that the prejudiced uh, FBI agent who was assigned to her murder never took the case seriously. And her case to this day still is used as a kind of a textbook, book, textbook example of what is wrong with law enforcement in solving cases of, of MMIW. Okay, next slide. Um, the second person that I personally lost uh, was my high school friend and classmate, Sandra Vicente, and she was murdered in 1986. Um, and having no way to return to college in Phoenix after a holiday visit home to Winter Rock, she decided to hitchhike uh, back to Phoenix, um, the 280 miles. Um, and her body was later found on the side of the road near Heber, Arizona, showing signs of sexual assault. 
and she was a good student. She was athletic and she was really funny. Um, but like so many Native Americans, she was poor. So it's incredibly sad to think that the lack of a ride back to college would end her life. <clears throat> and, at, and to add insult to injury, her life is erased. And I couldn't find anything in my research about her violent death um, 30 years later. Um, and her case is now just treated as another Indian who died at the side of the road. Next slide. So every single one of us who is presenting here today has a personal story of losing a loved one to murder. And we all come from different areas of the country and we all belong to different tribes and yet it, we all share this experience. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is that? Why are indigenous women susceptible to kidnapping, rape and murder? And next slide. In order to understand why Native American or Native women are susceptible to violent crime and murder, we need to take a look at the past. Um, and unfortunately, we're gonna revisit our friend colonialism, which I think most of people are familiar with, as to what happened to the indigenous populations of this country. Um, and so why is colonialism something that, that, that occurred so long ago, uh, still affecting Native po populations today? Well, in this painting, we see it's from 1872, and we see it's a painting of Manifest Destiny uh, by John Gass. Um, and in the, in the painting, you can see Columbia, who is the female figure representing America, um, forging ahead across the land, bringing knowledge and represented by the book in her hand and progress via uh, the telegraph line in her left hand. Um, she is enlightenment, basically driving darkness across the land. And what do we see in that bottom left corner uh, running off the land? It, well, that, that's Native Americans. And this kind of is a telling uh, view of, of, of colonialism. And, and uh, from the start of the United States Republic, um, that, that, we, that in order for our country to progress, Native Americans must be driven off the land uh, or assimilated to accept the new ways. Next slide. Um, so we all know 1492, Columbus arrives into the new world and he realized that he, he realizes that he has discovered two important resources. We have the land and the inhabitants of the new land. Um, the indigenous populations are seen as potential converts to Christianity or as potential slaves. Um, missionaries start arriving around in the, in the 1500s <clears throat> and they're sent from Europe to educate and convert uh, the natives to Christianity. And conversion serves as a way to tame Native Americans, uh, making them more docile and less resistant to the oncoming wave of European settlers that are coming. Uh, the missionaries build missions and eventually schools where native children will be taught to, be, to abandon their traditional ways of life and languages. Next slide. So this is an example of a mission um, uh, on my reservation, the Navajo Nation in the south, Southwest US. <clears throat> and this is uh, St. Michael's and it was established by uh, Catholic Jesuit priest missionaries in 1898 outside the Navajo capital of Windorock, Arizona. Um, the school was established in 1902. Uh, Navajo children were forced to, to leave their homes to attend boarding schools like this. Uh, in the process, they, they lost their identity, both of self and community. community. <clears throat> Excuse me. My mother was forced to leave her Hogan home um, where she lived with her grandmother, Elizabeth, in Lukachukai, Arizona, uh, to attend boarding schools at the age of seven. Um, and in fact, she did uh, attend St. Michael's. Um, my mother attended four, four boarding schools um, and in New Mexico, Oklahoma, California, and Arizona. And basically my mother was essentially raised by schools. Um, there was no, where there, you know, there's no parental nurturing care that growing children should experience. Um, loneliness and depression were common as Native children at boarding schools often only got to travel home to see family once or twice a year. Um, my mother was forbidden to speak Navajo, forbidden from wearing anything that could identify her as a Navajo. 
and corporal punishment was the norm. Children were taught to be embarrassed of being Indian, uh, to be ashamed of their native way and languages. Uh, this is what we now recognize uh, as cultural genocide and the trauma uh, inflicted upon this generation is still with us today. Next slide. Cultural genocide um, is basically the killing of the Indian to save the man. Um, uh, it's the policy to assimilate um, that uh, will strip Native Americans of their Native ident identities uh, and it will punish them if they speak their own Native languages, rid them all, of all semblance of, of their Indianness. This photo is from um, the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Uh, and they like to do this before and after type of photo um, to show you know, the children as they arrived. And then after um, attending school or being immersed in school, this, the right side is you know, the, the tame uh, assimilated child. Um, what these success stories don't tell is that many of these children died from foreign disease, that they caught in boarding schools. Many of, many of these children were physically abused um, and sexually abused at boarding schools, adding to the historical trauma of our people. Um, my own uh, Pawnee great-grandfather, Henry Roberts, attended here and met my own um, Chippewa grandmother um, at Carlisle. So next slide. Um, <clears throat> cultural genocide has had a lasting impact on our people. Forced removal of, of, of native populations from traditional lands led to a loss of, way, of, of the ways to sustain our lives. Um, we were placed on reservations, areas often chosen um, are desolate, areas that weren't traditionally part of our homelands. Uh, so instead of migrating to where resources are each season, we were stuck um, in, in one area lacking resources or what they thought was lacking resources to sustain the people. Um, now we see that generations later, these conditions on some of the reservations are akin to th third world conditions. Uh, poverty is rampant on reservations due to high unemployment and lack of resources. This loss of culture, way of life, identity, hope is this cultural genocide led some of our people to alcohol and drugs to deal with the trauma and desolation of everyday life. Substance abuse puts women, especially in vulnerable positions to be exploited, harmed and murdered. Next slide. And as we heard in Karina's uh, presentation previously, um, the problems, same problems exist for Native Americans in urban areas. Um, as, as of 2019, for all of North America's population, Native Americans account for only one, one and a half percent of the population. But we, we still, we, we are, we make up more than 10% of the homeless population nationally. Next slide. Um, other reasons uh, Native, Native American women are susceptible to violent crimes um, is of course just Bottom line, racism. Um, there's been historic maltreatment by the majority population. We are a conquered people. Um, we are not seen as human and therefore um, we are expendable. So um, in 2015, the National Congress of American Indians found that an estimated 40% of female victims of sex trafficking uh, identify as American Indian, Alaska Native, and uh, or First Nations. Um, so why 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 are they seeking natives? Well, um, according to an expert on sex trafficking, they basically we're associated with fetishes such as long hair, exotic looks that sex patrons perceive as Asian or Hispanic. We could look like anything. So as we've seen before. Uh, cultural genocide leads to poverty. It leads to hopelessness and substance abuse. There are problems and violence in the home as parents raised um, in boarding school systems no longer know how to raise children. Uh, this contributes to high rates of involvement with child welfare systems, and in turn leads to homelessness with children running away from home. The result is a vulnerable population, um, easy to exploit, 
uh, for sex traffickers. <clears throat> Um, in a recent interview with an Oregon Department of sex, Justice Sex Trafficking Unit, they noted that incar incarcerated sex traffickers admitted that they intentionally target indigenous women because they're susceptible. Next slide. Uh, other reasons we're susceptible, we're, we're vulnerable because our image is hypersexualized from Pocahontas to Cher to um, the haughty native princess costumes at Halloween to the recent disturbing trend of um, non-native women wearing headdresses and bikinis at uh, music festivals and you know, on Instagram, um, it, it doesn't help anything. Next slide. Um, other reasons are mascots. Um, mascots dehumanize Native Americans, uh, we are seen as caricatures and not humans. Um, and, you know, honestly, we are related with the past, <clears throat> with the recent um, decisions by uh, some teams to dis discontinue the use of their ma mascots that are racist. Uh, but there are still some teams still clinging on, you know, to those racist mascots. And, you know, it's, it's well past time to ban all Native American mascots. Next slide, please. Um, social, social isolation. Um, so uh, Mary explained uh, the, the mess of legal barriers that we face when seeking justice, but there are other barriers, including social isolation and cultural barriers. Native American women um, as a minority in urban areas may be hesitant to seek help from doctors, law enforcement, and social service staff that who may be of other ethnicities, um, and they might may be hesitant because they feel that these professionals wouldn't understand the issues facing a native person. I may, I myself have felt um, pre prejudice in a doctor's office here in Portland. Um, so it's a real thing that we experience. Next slide, please. So there, we also suffer from geographic isolation, especially folks who live in tribal lands. Tribal lands are, are often vast and isolated. Um, uh, sometimes services are hard to reach uh, due to lack of transportation or poor roads and long distances. <clears throat> often homes do not have a, a physical address making emergency response difficult. Um, on reservations, uh, the small town nature of closed close-knit tribal communities creates issues of privacy, preventing indigenous women to seek help where everybody else knows your business. Um, these factors can prevent indigenous women from obtaining adequate medical care and law enforcement response when they have, a, they've been attacked. <clears throat> Next slide. When we look at the uh, missing murdered indigenous women problem, it is, it's a knee-jerk reaction to victim blame. Uh, she shouldn't have been you know, on the streets. She shouldn't have been hitchhiking. She shouldn't have been wearing that. Instead of asking, why did he rape her? Why did he kill her? Um, as you can see, there are many reasons Native American women suffer violent crimes at a higher rate than women in, of uh, other ethnic groups. Um, hopefully, after hearing our presentations today, you will come away with an understanding that there are so many deep hidden causes to this problem. Um, and many of those harken back to the historical trauma our people have suffered since colonization. So we are invulnerable when we lose our identity and culture. We are vulnerable because we are seen as less than human. We are vulnerable because, we, because our image is hypersexualized throughout history. We are vulnerable because we are viewed as dehumanizing mas mascot caricatures. We are so much more than that, and we deserve every chance to live a happy, fulfilling life. While the situation seems dire, um, there is hope. Native Americans are demanding, demanding to be seen and heard, and we speak for our missing, murdered sisters, and we will continue to fight to stop this epidemic. So we stand tall for Misty, Jesse, Selena, Amanda, Priscilla, Sandra, and Heather, and we give our voice to the voiceless. Next slide. 
As Native Americans, we are constantly fighting to be seen as strong, intelligent members of the community, and we are not alone. As indig Indigenous women across the country are running for and winning political races across the country, um, people like um, Representative Sharice Davis, Davids of uh, Kansas and Representative Deb Holland now serve in the US Congress. Um, they have helped shine a light on, on the MMIW problem and are actively working on solutions. Uh, they are successfully, uh, they successfully sponsored the Not Invisible Act and Savannah's Act, uh, which Mary spoke of, um, which were signed into law last October. <clears throat> and while it's not the, you know, not the cure-all, it's still a step in the right direction. Um, the two bill, bills are aimed at addressing the MMIW crisis. And that just proves that, you know, representation absolutely matters. And we need more of that representation in our Congress and Senate. In conclusion, we are merely here to ask that you see us, um, really see us as your fellow human beings. Uh, we ask that you join us in your efforts, in our efforts to stop the epidemic of MMIW and to be our allies. Um, so, ayehe. Thank you for coming and uh, thank you for your time and for listening with an open mind and heart. And I, with that, I turn it over back to Katie. Thank you, Caroline. And thanks everybody for sticking with us this far. Before we transition to the question and answer portion of the training, we wanted to make sure that we shared some additional information on how to learn more and lend support. A lot of you might be feeling like this is really heavy information. This is something I didn't know about. How can I help? What can I do? How do I learn more or share this with others? And I think some of our high level suggestions, including calling, writing, emailing, or tweeting your representatives and legislators. We all have an opportunity to advocate for changes to increase the safety for Native women to address the crisis of missing and murdered Native women and girls by the federal government with agencies who have responsibilities to support this effort, including the Department of Justice, Department of the Interior, and Health and Human Services. Specific things that we can all ask for, including encouraging these agencies to review, revise, and create law enforcement and justice protocols that address the disappearance of Native women and girls, including interjurisdictional issues like those that Mary talked about. We can encourage these agencies to provide increased victim services to the families and community members of the disappeared or murdered Native women, such as counseling for the children of the disappeared, burial assistance, and community walks or healing ceremonies. We can also ask these agencies and entities to coordinate their efforts across federal departments to increase the response to the disappearance and murder of Native women and girls. And we can encourage all of these federal agencies to coordinate their efforts with Indian tribes to increase the response of state governments where appropriate to the cases of disappearance or murders of Native women and girls. Um, I'd also encourage everybody to take some time to learn about the tribes that are in your area, our area and region their priorities and issues, and where there may be an opportunity to work with them directly to provide support. There are also over 25 tribally led or tribal serving organizations in the greater Portland area, many of whom work on the MMIW issue in a variety of the services and programs that they provide, including the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, the Native American Youth and Family Association, and the Native Wellness Institute, just to name a few. Mary, can we do next slide? So for folks who are interested in learning more, um, we encourage you to check out these pages available on Facebook, Instagram, and other places online. We've featured three here that are established, vetted, and run by indigenous activists in the Pacific Northwest, including Save Our Sisters MMIW, MMIW USA, and MMIW Washington. If you're interested in ensuring that you can stay up to date on indigenous women that may go missing in our region, these pages are all resources, as we've discussed earlier in the presentation, um, that provide representation and coverage of women who are missing that are often left out of the coverage by major news outlets. When the government fails, many Indigenous families take their searches online. We can follow along and help. The hashtags listed here should also direct folks to other available pages and resources and information on most major social media platforms. Next slide. Aside from the pages, we also wanted to highlight a handful of Indigenous female activists that folks can follow. Rosalie Fish, who's in the left-hand corner of the slide, is a member of the Cowlitz tribe who chooses or has chosen in the past to run at all of her track meets 
representing Eastern Washington University to represent women from near her home and in Washington state. She's a star athlete and uses her running to bring awareness to the issue. Marita Growing Thunder Fogarty, who is on the right-hand side of the slide, is a member of the Fort Peck Assiniboine Sioux Tribe and a student at the University of Montana. She's the founder of the Save Our Sisters organization and also the organizer of the annual 80 mile march to honor missing and murdered indigenous women on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Marita runs the Save Our Sisters Facebook page on the previous slide. In addition to these efforts, she also brought attention to the cause and I believe you can find coverage of her in Teen Vogue through her efforts at Polson High School to wear a ribbon skirt each day of her senior year of high school. Many of the ribbon skirts were made with ribbons and fabric donated by families of women who succumbed to the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic in Montana. In the center of the slide, you'll see Sunny Red Bear, a Lakota tribal member living in South Dakota at 20, um, oh my gosh, we did this a couple years ago. I think she's probably closer to 30 now, excuse me. Um, she has overcome years of sexual and emotional abuse by her adoptive white father and a subsequent court trial guilty plea for her abuser. Overcome alcoholism is in recovery and has been most recently able to celebrate the birth of a second child. It's only recently that she's been able to move beyond survival and she's now a strong advocate for legal and policy changes to protect and support Native American women in South Dakota. Not featured here also Another um, indigenous woman leader to follow is Abigail Echo Hawk, who is the chief executive officer at the Seattle Indian Health Board, who worked to produce the report that Karina discussed earlier in our presentation. Next slide. The city of Portland sponsored a week-long uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women event in 2019. I think that they'll definitely resume that as soon as the COVID pandemic um, allows us to do that safely. During that series of events, they had invited speaker panels, a red dress special at the PSU powwow, a ribbon skirt workshop, a house bill public hearing. Um, in addition, the city of Portland and the Metro Regional Government have both proclaimed Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Day on May 5th every year. Um, there are local opportunities like this that folks can find online and plug into and uh, find opportunities how to show up and support. I would encourage folks to also track the work of Laura John, the Tribal Relations Director at the City of Portland, who's been using her position and role to advocate and make progress on this issue. Next slide. Um, there are also um, some select local resources that we've listed here. We encourage our attendees to follow up online to learn more about these, what these entities do, and identify opportunities to volunteer and lend a hand. These are all local resources open to people from all walks of life and all communities and all backgrounds to provide support um, when suffering from some of the instances of violence that we've discussed in the presentation today. I will also put a couple links in the chat uh, during the Q&A for the National Indian Women's Resource Center, which is a leading national organization that has a Speaking Our Truth podcast for change, a restoration publication, and a few other great resources that folks might be interested in following up on. And lastly, um, and maybe Laura, or excuse me, Mary, um, I'll get some brownie points from you for mentioning this. There's currently a case called United States v. Cooley that will be heard before the Supreme Court of the US, I believe at the end of this month. The issue at hand includes whether or not a police officer of an Indian tribe has the authority to temporarily detain and search a non-Indian on a public right of way within a reservation based on a potential violation of state or federal law. A ruling from the Supreme Court could be especially felt by the tribes um, who are attempting to address the problem of missing and murdered indigenous people. And with that, I think we have a poem we'd like to share with you all that Mary will pull up in just a moment. <laughs> To the indigenous woman, I'm sorry we have not fought harder for you. For the woman and her baby left for dead by the police in her home while they gave a ride to her attacker back to his house. To the girlfriend punched in her pregnant stomach, to the wife who took the beatings so her kids wouldn't have to. To the daughter who found a man as abusive as her dad, to the co-ed who will never go to the nine again to the restraining order as strong as the paper it's made from, 
and to the shelter with not enough beds. I give 1,000 sweats for rape victims, 1,000 doctorings for husbands, 1,000 prayer ties for courage, 1,000 meetings for silence, 1,000 songs for patience, and 1,000 fires for enough light to fill a room, to reflect off a mirror the size of the moon just so we can see ourselves for what we are, complicit. So I dare you to protect them, Mr. President. I dare you to make laws for them, Senator and Representatives. I dare you to try to stop me, tribal leaders. I dare you to go look for me, police officer. For every 1,000 Native women in your district, 330 of them will be sexually assaulted. 88% of the perpetrators will be non-Native. And every piece of every legislation needs a champion. But not all champions are leaders, and not all leaders are men, just like not all kisses are wanted, and not all laws are consensual. They trespass her body like they trespass this land. In the corner of a hut home, in the back seat of a car, in a courtroom, in every hall of every government, we fail them. And the terrorist threat is in the same house, in the same car, goes to the same school, and works at the same job. And a threat ten times more likely to murder her than anyone else. This war is at home. Living room battlegrounds, bathroom infirmaries, backseat trenches, fists like tanks, sex like a war trophy. Under treaties of silence, she whispered to me, Please, please stop. I am your wife. I am your sister. I am your mother. I am your daughter. You are supposed to protect me. You are supposed to be a warrior. Protect me from you, from him, from all of them. Tell me you have daughters. Tell me you don't want this for them. Tell me you won't joke about this with your friends. Tell me you won't forget we talk. Tell me you will do something. Do something. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to reshuffle the screens around. Let's see. Although I, I think our last screen just says questions. So thank you everybody for, for participating and sitting through this. We know it's a really intense topic. And so we, again, really appreciate your willingness to participate and engage and learn about this. And um, I think there was a question. Let me try and get back to navigate with uh, one hand. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay, so a question. So have we come across any info on progress made as a result of Savannah's law, which was named after Savannah Graywin, who was murdered in Fargo, North Dakota, and that was passed about a year ago or so. Yeah, so that bill was passed. Um, I think it was um, presented originally about a year ago, and it actually became law in October, November, just this past year, so four, four ish months ago. But I don't know um, personally of any direct progress coming out of that. I mean, the, the bill itself is progress. And I think it's also definitely setting the tone that at a congressional level, folks are paying attention. I think that trickles down to the state level because we see a lot of states passing really similar legislation, especially states that are uh, have high populations of indigenous people. So I think everything's trending in the right direction. But what we really need to see, I think one of the biggest issues is that Supreme Court case that I mentioned that says that tribes can't prosecute non-Indians when they commit crimes against tribal members on the reservation. Like the Supreme Court says that, but Congress still has the ability to change to ch change that result. Congress can go and pass a law and say um, tribes absolutely can prosecute non-Indians, and that would be a huge fix to the to the situation. And also, if tribes have um, more sentencing power, if a tribe tribal police can go out and arrest somebody and then put them in jail for twenty years if you murder somebody. 
that's going to help deter this type of conduct on reservations as well. Let's see, another question. How might we reconcile the tension between needing to slash feeling like you have to rely on police and federal government resources for the facilitation of justice with the reality that police and federal agents continue to harm indigenous communities? That's a, a really great question. Um, Katie, do you might have a response or Caroline Karina? I would offer that I think that there are a lot of grassroots um, community led efforts underway to provide support to um, tribal families and folks who are victim to the, the crimes and the issue that we've discussed here. I think there are also tribes who are taking matters into their own hand to pass code laws and, and, and legislation within their own tribal governments, tribal nations on their tribal reservations to provide more support to victims and the families of victims when these uh, crimes occur. And that's one area or hopefully an opportunity where community members and folks who are experiencing these issues don't have to necessarily rely on the uh, federal state government and you know the lack of trust and the you know with the federal and state government in responding to some of these issues. But I believe as Mary mentioned, there is a need for tribal governments and tribal citizens on Indian lands to get some of those changes made um, through the passage of federal laws to, a remedy, uh, to address or remedy part of these issues. Um, Karina and Caroline, do you have other comments? Something I was thinking too to add to that is that I think we're all so aware of the systemic racism and systemic issues within our own federal government. And, but we're also starting to see that change. As Caroline mentioned, we're seeing actual Native Americans in the House of Representatives and being uh, in, the, in the Senate. And now we have Deb Holland uh, likely becoming the department, uh, the secretary of the Department of Interior, and that's historic. She's a Native American woman, so I think we'll hopefully like across the board on all issues, whether it's MMIW, uh, racism, Black Lives Matter, all these issues that we've are just you know grappling with head on over the last few years. I, I'm hopeful. I, I try and be an optimist, but it it seems like as we get some of the right people in the right positions that things will start to change. Things have to change. And I think I would also just add that um, tribes need the, as Mary just said, the authority and ability to prosecute those crimes and, and handle those issues as a sovereign nation. But it does take resources and the federal government does have a federal tribal trust responsibility and they absolutely do need to fund tribes and be held accountable to providing the funding for tribes to be able to do that. So um, the tribes exchanged millions of acres of land for um, various goods and services and part of that is um, law enforcement funds and they need to have the funding to be able to do that. So I would you know, say that tribes hopefully we'll be able to receive the additional funding that they need to protect their people. And one last comment was just acknowledging that this is a, a hard and difficult topic to, to talk about and um, expressing appreciation. And so, you know, again, thank you to all of you that, that logged in and participated. We hope you uh, enjoyed the session, even though it was a difficult topic. Hopefully you learned something and um, have a, a great weekend.